Taylor. <laughs> Six, seven, eight. Good morning, everybody. We have quorum. So I'll call us to order at nine o'clock. Uh, Taylor, feel you roll call. Juliet Ballard. Marta Larson. Present, participating from Northfield Township, Michigan. Marie Gress. Uh, present, calling from Maryland, Michigan. Margaret Reynolds. Present, calling in from Pittsfield Township. Elizabeth Thompson. Present, calling in from Ypsilanti Township. Jennifer Green. Present, participating from the city of Ypsilanti. Phyllis Herzig. Present, participating from Ann Arbor. Bruce Estrain. You're muted. Bruce, you are muted. All right. <laughs> Reporting um, from, Ann Ar from Ann Arbor with a dog in the background. Jennifer Heckendorn. Present calling from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Brenda McKinney. Present, Superior Township, Michigan. Jasmine Cooper has an excused absence. Allison Foreman. Uh, Allison Foreman, um, remote logging in from Ypsilanti Township. Commissioner Somerville. And I did see Juliet Ballard. Juliet Ballard from Dexter, Michigan. We have quorum. Great. Um, public participation. I see two members of the public um, as attendees. You can raise your hand if you would like to make public comment. Monica, I see you. I uh, clicked allowed to talk. You should be good to go. Okay, thank you very much. And I just want to give a big shout out and thank you for the petitioning and speaking with the commissioners to get them to agree to um, allow the millage to go on the ballot in November. Um, I know now we're going to have to switch gears from talking to the commissioners and now start talking to the public. I don't think it's going to be a hard sell because there are so many seniors that are needing needing everything. <laughs> and this will be a great start to rectify some of the, the needs that have been in the community. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ipsy Meals on Wheels, I uh, allowed you to talk. You should be good to go. Good morning, everybody. I would go on screen, but I'm still dealing with a little bit of a virus. I did want to also extend my deepest gratitude to all of you for the work that you did for the millage to pass. And, um, and Marie and I got a chance to connect a little bit yesterday to start you know, not trying to skip over July 10th, but to start thinking about November and um, doing a, trying to put together a public information, organize a public information campaign, just so that we don't leave anything to chance. So um, this is all very exciting and super excited to be part of this work. Happy to answer any questions. Um, I can just be reached my email. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, those are the only two members of the public, so we can go to commission's response to public participation. Um, and Ashley, I have a follow-up question for you. So this um, reading that Monica and Barb just both mentioned now um, was the first reading, and we have a second reading on July 10th that needs to pass before we go into like campaign mode and like letting the Right? Am I correct with yes. that? Yes. Yep, that is correct. Great. Um, so just with that that correction, Monica, we we need to be thinking about July 10 still. We need to be talking to our commissioners still. And we're gonna talk more about that when we get to our subcommittees. Um, because I know one of our subcommittees has started talking about <laughs> next steps and all of that uh as well. And Ashley, I'll have some more follow-up questions for you at that point too. 
Um, anyone else no. want to respond? Sorry, just very quickly, Marie. Um, happy to answer any questions. Commissioner Somerville is just running a little bit late. She will be here shortly. Um, so you will have both Annie and myself. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, anyone else want to respond to a public comment? Great. And then we'll move on to the next item, approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion? So move. A second? Fill us a second. Um, any discussion? Great. Taylor, will you do the vote? Julia Ballard? Yes. Marta Larson? Yes. Marie Gress? Yes. Margie Reynolds? I'm going to abstain because I was on vacation last week. Wasn't here. Elizabeth Thompson? Yes. Jennifer Green? Yes. Phyllis Herzig? Yes. Bruce Estrain? Yes. Jennifer Heckendorn? Yes, I was absent, but I did watch the meeting um, online. Brendan McKay. Yes. Jasmine Cooper is excused. Allison Foreman. I'm going to abstain as I was not part of that meeting. Motion still passes. All right. Uh, discussion items. We are hoping to have a presentation from Bassett Law on end of life planning and aging in place. Um, they are not here yet. So um, let's do sub some the subcommittee updates. Sound good? Um, Jennifer, do you have any updates from Bassett Law? Yes, they will be here. I told them around 915 in case we had oh. other things going on. Perfect. Um, then let's start with the town hall updates. That is next week, Friday. Brenda, I'll turn it over to you. Well, um, I just want to update that uh, the event is next Friday and a lot of great response. That's, I think we should have a good turnout. And I want to thank everyone uh, for participating. And um, Marie, thank you for all that you're doing. Um, did you get my um, response this morning for the, okay, okay. And uh, let's just hope that um, we have a good turnout, which I think we will. So um, that's all I have to report that we should have a good turnout. The response has been very well. Good. Jennifer? Um, yeah, I just wanted to update on um, so far, the resource tables that we have confirmed, and if I have missed any, if uh, Brenda or Marie, you could let me know, but we have Bank of Ann Arbor, uh, Bassett, Murray Law, Lori's Hands, The Wave, Phoenix, uh, JFS, and I have a couple other, oh, Washington County Parks, and I have a couple others that I'm just waiting on some um, confirmation from, like JFS, Housing Bureau for Seniors, I'm pretty sure they're coming, um, and a couple other folks. Um, Taylor, it, will Age Wave be having a table at our events? Yes. Okay, all right, great. Elizabeth? That was what I was going to ask about Age Ways. Mm -hmm. um, uh, are there any board members that have uh, anyone that would want to participate and share resource information? Julia, Jennifer, anyone? Uh, there is. Um, I would like to add a table if possible. Do you have more room or no? Well, what we can make room. I mean, we'll make it work. Okay. I, I sent you an email with the, um, the information for an additional table. Okay. We'll make it work. Who is that? It's JYB Home Care. Okay. When did you send that? Um, last night at one in the morning when I was working. Oh, okay. Well, Jot that down and we will make it work. 
Okay. We will make it work, okay? Thank if you. someone has to share a table, we'll make it work. All right, no problem. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, who are the confirmed panelists, Brenda? Pardon? The panelists that you have for the town hall? Yes, I have everyone confirmed. So you you have the three commissioners, you have the state representative? Yes, and the wow. mayor of Chelsea, Debbie Dingle, everyone has confirmed. Yay, that's great. That, that was done early on. Yes, everyone confirmed. That's awesome. Thank you so much for your work on that. Mm -hmm. um, and like now the timing of it is just like perfect. <laughs> yeah. So I'm really excited about that. Any well, other questions? Gary isn't on the, uh, the agenda, but I am going to let him speak about the senior millage. So he oh, and great. I have discussed that. Awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. And the, the mayor of Chelsea is going to welcome everyone. So. Uh, Phyllis. I was, just, <clears throat> I was just curious whether um, there are topics that you're hoping to cover. Fortunately, the millage, but um, other things that. Um... Yes. And I did send that out to the panelists and we, I think I sent that out to everyone. If not, I'll send it out again, but it was going to be around safety and other uh, concerns that seniors have. And they will have the opportunity to um, ask the panelists about things that aren't on the flyer, if it's just everyday needs and things that seniors need. So the audience will have an opportunity. But I still haven't heard from anyone from your organization. I'm waiting to hear from them. And I talked to Ryan Hunter and he was gonna take care of that, but I haven't heard anything from the Jewish um, center yet. From Jewish Family Service? Yes. Uh, yes, I'm on the board there and I'll, I'll uh, check with people and see. Okay, uh, well, I, you might wanna mention it to Ryan Hunter because he and I did speak. Okay. Thank you. Great, any other? Questions for Brenda in the town hall? <clears throat> awesome. <clears throat> well, well uh, I just want to say this last thing. I'm going to make yeah. sure that the board is introduced. So make sure everyone is prepared. Great. And I don't want to surprise you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, Jane Bassett is now here. And so Jane, if you're ready, we'd love to turn the floor over to you. Tell us uh, who you are, what Bassett Law is, and then um, we have you on for end of life planning. Um, do you need a, do you need the ability to share your screen, Jane? No, I don't think so. Great. I don't think so. I just texted Amanda. She is going to jump on as well. So um, but I can get started letting you know a little bit about who we are and um, hang on just a second. It's um, classic Zoom issues. She's looking for oh. the link. <laughs> so, um, so I'm Jane Bassett. I'm um, one of the two partners for Bassett Murray Law Group here in Ann Arbor. I've been practicing for 30 years, 30 years plus, uh, in the area of um, elder law, probate, and estate planning. Amanda is my law partner, and um, she has been practicing with our office for about 12 or 13 years now and um, has served on the elder um, elders subsection of the state bar, their um, committee, uh, governing committee, and um, has had a hand in um, helping to develop some laws in Michigan um, that help um, seniors with um, services that they need or um, to preserve their rights. So we've been heavily involved in this for uh, quite some time and it's it's what we do. We, we help people with aging and um, disability issues. So um, there's Amanda. Hi, good morning. Welcome Amanda. Thank you. 
we we both have kids that are finishing up the school year right now so mornings are a bit hectic appreciate mm -hmm. you being patient with us um so i am going to amanda i did the introduction of who we are um and let's see here um, you are going to talk about um, the next section, which is planning for yourself and the people that you care for when uh, end of life issues are coming up. Yeah, so um, planning for yourself in general, um, you know, people need to uh, take a look at their estate planning documents, but these become even more important, um, you know, if someone is entering the, the final stages of their life. So I just um, wanna reiterate the importance of taking a look at um, estate planning documents. Um, and, I'm, and those are your power of attorney for medical, which Jane will get into um, in detail later in the presentation, um, your power of attorney for finances. Both of those documents help a person during their lifetime. So they become very important um, if somebody is becomes incapacitated um, or has some sort of disability, physical disability where they can't leave their home as well. Um, the power of attorney for finances helps somebody um, assist with their financial decision making, um, kind of steps into their shoes financially. That person is known as an attorney in fact. Um, and then the power of attorney for medical um, uh, nominates someone to make your medical decisions. Um, and I'm talking about that briefly just because those two documents um, really do come into play and are important for someone who is ill or um, entering the, the last stages of their life. You know, it's just as important to um, for young people um, because emergencies can happen, right? People get in car accidents, have um, undiagnosed things happen to them. Um, so those documents are, are very important because they assess during someone's lifetime. And then planning for your for yourself, your person um, through distributing assets. And that can be done through a will, through a trust, um, or through beneficiary designation. Um, what's really important here is that if you care for someone else, um, you need to think about that as well. Or, or your, um, so if, if somebody has a disabled adult child or if someone has minor children, taking those things into consideration and making them part of an estate plan is very important. So our law allows us to nominate guardians um, through our documents for um, our for our children. And if you have a, a disabled adult child, um, you know, sometimes those children um, have guardianships through the court system. And if they do, you can nominate standby guardians. Um, and so it's about planning for and not only for yourself, but any any for anyone who is dependent upon you as well that you help care for. Um, anything else to add to that, Jane? No, I, I think that's it. I mean, all of these documents work together to address all of the concerns that we would have um, as as you know, as we face the end of our life how do we figure out how to carry on the things that we've done for our families that we've done for ourselves um, and provide some substitute decision making for that so it's not just doing a medical power of attorney it's all of the documents that work together to make that happen for people yeah but um i think we were asked to focus a little bit more heavily on um medical powers of attorney and end of life decision making. So I wanna to get to that. That of course would be handled through a, a medical power of attorney. Sometimes it's called a um, patient advocate designation. It goes by different names, but it all kind of has the same function. So here in Michigan, um, we have 
a law that governs it and it specifies that um, we can draft a document that says who we want to make our decisions. We can put parameters about what kinds of decisions that person can make. Um, and we can name a successor person. And then that document, if it's notarized and witnessed, is good to go. Um, the, the hospitals, the doctors, nursing homes should be relying on that document as the word, the, the nomination of the person that they have to talk to about your care. Um, now, sometimes people come in and they say, I want a living will. Well, living wills are great. They're a way of letting your patient advocate know what you would want or not want for your care, um, but they're not legally enforceable in Michigan. Michigan says we use the power of attorney to nominate a person rather than setting um, forth a list of instructions to our doctor. The reason that the law is structured that way in Michigan is, as we know, having just gone through a pandemic, we never know what's around the next corner. We never know what's going to be coming up medically for diagnoses or medically for um, cures or treatments that are available. And so we want a person who we trust to be appointed to be there in real time to listen to what's happening, what the diagnosis is, what the prognosis is, what the options are for treatment, and be able to make a decision standing in our shoes as to what we would want um, to um, for, for that treatment, um, those treatment possibilities. Sometimes people come in and sit down with us and they say, I want everything possible done. And then we start kind of talking through it and maybe they walk back a little bit, maybe they don't, maybe they really want everything possible done. But it's their decision to make and it's important for the patient advocate to understand where that person is coming from, what their ethics and values are, what they will or will not tolerate being done to their body, um, especially when they're not able to communicate for themselves. So that living will, while it's not legally enforceable, it's still important because it gives that patient advocate the ability to go back and read through it and kind of glean hints on what that person would want them to do or say for them. The patient advocate is required to make decisions based on what they know the uh, principal wants, not what they want for the principal. So um, and that's so such a, really a big important. difference. That's a, such yes. a big difference there um, because, you know, people often want to just name their kids or their spouse or, um, you know, someone like that um, who's close to them. But questioning too, is that person, does that person have the capability of making that decision for the, um, for the person who is sick? So for the patient, uh, and are they able to carry out what the, those wishes are on their behalf? So sorry to interrupt, Jane. That's okay. That's okay. Perfect timing. So um, with that in mind, we, we encourage people to write out their own living will. It can be formal. It can be using a form that we give them that, you know, they can fill in the blanks. It can be using one of the five wishes forms that kind of walks through the different questions. That's a, a good way to get people to think about things. Um, it can be... I've had people do funny videos, um, they trying to lighten the mood, inject a little uh, comic relief. Um, it can be a letter. It, it can be any way that person wants to communicate um, with their patient advocate what they want, as long as they do something. <laughs> so that that's the one thing that I always encourage people to do with, uh, along with the power of attorney, let us draft that. So it's legal. We know it's good. We know it's going to hold up. You've got the counseling around it, the legal counseling, but then do that um, living will as well. When we do powers of attorney here in our office, we always ask uh, uh, at least five questions. We go over these individually so we can set the outer parameters of what the patient advocate can do. The first one is, do you want your patient advocate to be able to tell the doctors to withhold or withdraw life support or life-sustaining treatment? That has to be specifically spelled out 
in the power of attorney in order for the patient advocate to have authority over that. It needs to be a clear statement. We put it in big, bold letters, and we have them initial that separately so that it's absolutely clear if they want that to happen. The second one is, do you want your patient advocate to be able to sign a do not resuscitate order for you? Sounds very similar to people, but it actually is very different in the law and in operation of, of medical circles. So we address that separately. Do you want them to be able to authorize hospice care for you? So if you were terminally ill, um, do you want them to have the option of bringing in a hospice to keep you comfortable? Um, for a lot of people, that's a no-brainer. Absolutely. Other people maybe don't know what hospice is, and we have to go into that explanation a little bit so they understand. Um, and other people say, nope, I want everything possible done to keep trying to cure me. I don't care if the doctors say I'm going to, you know, that it's a terminal illness. Um, do you want your patient advocate to be able to donate your organs and tissues for someone else's use? Okay. And a lot of times people will say, well, I've got that on my, my license or I'm on the registry already. Well, that's great. But this is one more way of being able to quickly make that decision in, you know, when timing is critical. Um, do you want your patient advocate to make mental health treatment decisions for you? So the mental health code is different than the probate code. Um, our probate code governs what a patient advocate can do. Um, or what a guardian can do, uh, but it doesn't address mental health issues um, specifically. That's in a separate, whole separate law under Michigan, um, the Michigan Mental Health Code. And in that law, the rule has always been, if you can't make your own medical mental health um, treatment decisions because you are suffering from a mental health crisis, that the doctors would petition the probate court and a judge would decide if you have to submit to the treatment or not. We, oh, it's been about 15 years ago now, they kind of toggled both of those laws and they made them work together a little bit better. So now we can put in the provision that a patient advocate can make mental health treatment decisions. And as long as the patient doesn't revoke that power of attorney right when they need it the most, then the patient advocate can make those decisions and it keeps it from having to go to a judge. So you're not going to have a public court file. You're not going to have a hearing in front of a judge where people have to present testimony. It's, it's a very, it's a very Mm, not very dignified kind of proceeding for the person. It's it's really an affront to their personhood. So we like to see patient advocates having that authority instead of a judge. Now, the second part to that is because people sometimes aren't thinking very clearly in, in those moments, or maybe they're suffering from paranoia, they may decide they don't want their patient advocate making decisions for them. So if Amanda were my patient advocate and I said, I don't want her making decisions for me, I know she's poisoning my soup. Every day I get soup, it tastes funny, I know she's poisoning it, I don't want her anymore. If I said that, even if there was absolutely no basis um, for anything that I've said, I'm completely speaking out of paranoia and mental health concerns that power of attorney would disappear. Poof, it's gone. And then I have to go to see a judge, okay? But we can put in a provision that waives your right to revoke only the mental health portion and only for a period not to exceed 30 days. So if I had that in my power of attorney and I tried to revoke it, Amanda would still stay in place for the next 30 days. And hopefully I'd get on some medication, start thinking more clearly, and then at the end of the 30 days, I wouldn't want to revoke. Okay, that's that's the hope there. But that has to be spelled out specifically in the power of attorney in order for that whole process to work. So those are, um, that's the information about powers of attorney and living wills. There's a couple more advanced directives. And by the way, the term advanced directives comes from the federal law that governs um, Medicare and Medicaid facilities, any facility or doctor who receives um, payment from Medicare or Medicaid has to um, follow the, the regulations with regard to Medicaid and Medicare. 
And one of the provisions in there talks about advanced directives and that the healthcare facilities have to ask if the person has an advanced directive when they're registering or when they're coming in. So that's a very broad term. It covers a lot of different um, uh, scenarios that different states use, but in Michigan, it refers to the medical power of attorney, the living will, and a couple of others. It covers uh, do not resuscitate orders and the my post orders. So um, the do not resuscitate, of course, is a form that you file, you, you sign, um, and the doctor has to sign saying that if your heart and lungs stopped working, they would not do uh, resuscitation, okay? They would just let nature take its course, play out, and um, would not try to bring you back. So that's the do not resuscitate form. We're finding that as people leave nursing homes to go to the hospital and then come back again, each of those agencies want that re-signed when you come back in. So if, if I were at Celine Evangelical and I had a do not resuscitate in, in place, I left to go to St. Joe's for some treatment. They would want one signed there. And then when I came back to Celine Evangelical, they would want one signed again. So while a person can sign them while they're, they have capacity, it's also important to put that in that patient advocate designation or that power of attorney so that your patient advocate can continue um, to sign those as needed. Um, the other was the, the my post, MI-POST. This is a standing order that can be done when a person is um, in a critical, has critical care going on. They can sit down with their doctor and leave standing instructions about what they want for their care going forward. They also can put it in their power of attorney that they can, that the patient advocate can sign that ongoing as needed. So it's another way of, it's kind of, and it's kind of a living will, um, but it's done at a time when the person is facing critical care. They're at the very end of their lifetime. It's almost like a hospice type situation. Um, and it does help the, the doctors to be able to know what to do going forward. So those are the official documents. Unofficially, of course, hospitals sometimes turn to family members uh, when a person is in the hospital and they don't have these official documents in place um, in order to avoid going to probate court and getting a guardianship. They, the doctors kind of as a stopgap measure will oftentimes turn to the family and say, what do you want done? It's not necessarily... Um, you know, official, but um, I guess if they feel that, you know, there's nobody who's in the family who's going to object and cause liability for them, you know, it's it's okay to do. It also avoids having to go to probate court and get a guardianship, which can be timely and, uh, you know, time, um, take up time and cost money. And sometimes we don't have that amount of time with, if somebody is critically ill. So, um so anyway, that, that does happen, that does go on. Um, and then of course, if the family can't agree, then the last thing is going to the probate court and getting a guardianship, which of course is, you know, again, a very grueling process um, and not very dignified, so. I always um, like to say, and, and you know, um, right now people are in their own driver's seat right? You can execute a medical power of attorney and you can fill out your advanced directives um, and your, you know, to put your wishes down and nominate who you think you would trust to make those medical decisions in the event you could not. Um, and you're in the driver's seat to do that. If these documents aren't in place, there really is no one with legal authority to make decisions on behalf of the other another person. And that's where the probate court steps in to appoint somebody with legal authority to make those decisions. And that person is called the guardian. Um, and so um, I think of it like you're in the, you know, you're, you're, you're in the seat right now to make those decisions. 
Um, and you know, it's better for you to control what happens to yourself versus a probate court to control what happens to someone, right? Because um, one, I know it's difficult to think about end of life care and end of life planning, um, but it's so important um, so that someone's wishes are followed, someone's wishes are known, um, because if a court appoints somebody, that person might not know anything about that individual and still be um, tasked with making some really difficult decisions without guidance. So there's been a lot of um, press lately about professional guardians and problems. You, you see the sensational ones in the news. You don't hear about the ones every day that are, are going just fine and, and the guardians are doing their job. Um, Amanda and I both serve as professional guardian for people. And, and it is hard to step into someone's life when you don't know anything about them. Um, you know, you have to kind of go through their personal items and their, their papers and, you know, maybe talk with people they, if they have anyone in their life, a friend or a church uh, group or, um, you know, a distant relative to just try to find out any little thing about them that will help you make decisions. Um, otherwise, we're left to just doing what we think is best. And that's not always what the person would have wanted. Um, so it is really, really important to um, try to get those things in place while you can. Um, if it has to go to a guardianship, it has to. And, you know, hopefully we'll still have some good people uh, who are doing, who are willing to do this. The more pressure that gets put on professional guardians um, as far as, you know, the, the bad press, the, the negative public opinion, the... Um, pressure from the attorney general's office. We've been seeing some of that. Um, you know, there are bad ones that need to be gone after and shut down and and stopped, but there are also people who are doing this very critical um, work for people who don't have anybody else to care for them. And um, the more pressure it gets put on it, the, the fewer people who are gonna be willing to do that, so. Yeah. Um, and um, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say if uh, I wanted to just add a, a couple of miscellaneous things in um, in regards to some planning um, that that people can do. Um, one, uh, something to think about is prepaid funeral arrangements. So, um, you know, you can uh, actually uh, go to a funeral home, enter into a prepaid funeral contract. Um, and pay for that um, ahead of time and make preparation for, um, you know, if, if somebody wants to have a funeral, if they want to be cremated versus buried. And, um, you know, if they want, um, you know, I've had clients write their own obituary, which some, you know, people have different feelings about this, but it is, these are things that are options that are available. Um, to individuals. So um, a lot of times when we do Medicaid planning, which I'll talk about in just a moment, um, very briefly, um, the uh, prepaid funeral contracts are something that we always counsel clients to do to <laughs> Medicaid planning because you can spend down your money on yourself. And that's one way to do that. Um, in addition to um, prepaid funeral contracts, we now have something called a funeral representative um, that we can designate in our documents. And this person is in charge of or has the authority to direct um, what happens to an individual, um, uh, an individual's remains and burial and services. So we now can um, nominate who that person is. Our, if nobody has a funeral representative nominated, our Michigan law states that your next of kin is your funeral representative, which may or may not be okay with you. Um, 
So that's something just to be aware of because that's newer in the law, um, not brand new, but newer. Um, <clears throat> another thing I, I just wanna touch base upon is um, thinking about um, if you're, you're, you know, if you're in the end of your life or you're aging um, and what that, you know, what that uh, looks like to you as you age and get, um, you know, um, if, if you want to downsize, if, if, you know, you want to um, age in place at your home, if you want to not mow your grass anymore and you want to go into more of an independent but um, uh, assisted living type of place, um, or if you know um, you would want to go into a long-term care facility, and you know thinking about those things, um, if if hospice would be something that you would um, want to participate in, um, thinking about where you would want these things to happen and what your ultimate goal is. Um, is important and knowing the difference between them um, and also knowing uh, the funding sources. So with, with that being said, you know, there are cost sharing programs that um, our state has to help people pay for in-home health care and for additional assistance in the home. Um, there's long-term care insurance. So um, you know, all those uh, long-term care insurance plans are very different and cover different things. So it's very important to take a look at what, if, if somebody has long-term care insurance, what their contract says and what they would cover. Um, you know, our state has Medicaid. So um, you can, Medicaid planning may be an option for you to cover long-term care, um, uh, long-term nursing care. Um, we have two uh, alternative programs to actually going into a long-term care facility, uh, which is the PACE program and the My Choice Waiver program in Michigan. And that's getting additional supports in place for someone to be able to remain in their community um, versus uh, transitioning to a long-term care facility. And of course, um, exploring any veterans benefits that's available to somebody. So. Um, a couple of miscellaneous <laughs> things, but it's um, important. Along, along the lines of the veterans um, benefits, people sometimes miss some of the programs that they're eligible for. Um, for instance, service, service connected disability. Um, sometimes it's decades after service ends that a, a service connected disability can show up or become a problem such that um, you know, we can apply for it for a person. So, um, <clears throat> for instance, um, I talked with a couple recently, we, they came in to talk about Medicaid and, um, you know, kind of pre, pre review for Medicaid. And in talking with them, um, the man revealed that he had had some frostbite while he was, um, in service. And now he was had lost a couple of toes and was having balance issues and it was causing him to fall. That now is a disabling condition that leads back to a service-connected disability for which we can get monthly income um, to help pay for care in the home, care in assisted living. So all of these things, we can stack the different programs um, and put together a package so that the person maybe can stay at home and, and pay for some home care or go to an assisted living versus going to a nursing home. So um, there are options out there and sometimes just going through the scenario, the life of the person, we can find things that they may not have even known about. So, um, so yeah, that's all part of end of life planning. We want to make sure people have the resources that they need to be able to live where they want to live and how they want to live. So I think, Amanda, did we hit the end of our list here? We did hit the end of our list. So okay. I can answer any questions that anyone has. Absolutely. Yeah. Hands up, everybody. I know I have a few. Um, look at all these. This is great. Brenda, I have you first. Um, first of all, I would like to know your number for Bassett Law. 
Can I have that number? <laughs> okay. It's 734-930-9200. And where are you located? We're on Hogback Road, just two buildings north of the um, jail complex. Okay. Um, my first question is this. Like, I go to my doctor's office and she, she she's given me this form to fill out and it's for, what is it, guardian or uh, to fill out in case something were to happen to me? And is that medical attorney, a power of attorney or? Right. Yeah. So they they the doctors and hospitals have been handing these out because they want to know what to do, you know, if you become incapacitated. So um, a lot of times people don't have them. And so they provide a form. Um, it's, it is a uh, medical power of attorney or patient advocate designation form that could be captioned either way. And um, it, it is the form that you can use to nominate a person to um, make your decisions for you if you become incapacitated. It's better than having nothing. <laughs> right. I have seen some forms that don't comply with Michigan law, but if your doctor's office and the hospital is willing to honor their own form, you know, that's great. It's better than having nothing. I do think it's best to have some legal counseling and, you know, sit down and work through it. They're not that expensive to do. Um, I, our law office charges $250 to do that. So, um, yeah. One thing to add on that, so it's, it's very difficult for us as, as um, practitioners to, to assist in this, to know what law off, I mean, sorry, what doctor's offices are giving out what forms. And we've seen them labeled in a variety of different things. Um, Jane, I heard you mention earlier the last five wishes, mm -hmm. right? So we've seen that document titled the last five wishes, but within the document, making a patient does a uh, patient advocate designation. So, and I've also seen it called advanced directives, but it, it contains like a, a living will type of um, section in addition to a uh, power of attorney uh, for healthcare section. Um, we've also seen where it gets pretty detailed and ask questions in this scenario and it gives you a scenario would you want care yes no or i don't know um and those things um for for and i think Jeannie feel the same way for us it's it's a little bit um worrisome for a number of reasons one people change their mind so those exact scenarios um you know if you've marked off a box um, would, would you have remembered in three years from now you, you checked yes or no? And really, do you understand the question that's being asked? Um, you know, and then lastly, um, you know, if you sign documents at your specific doctor's office, but then you get medical care from another facility, um, are they going to know, are they going to honor that or you know, are they going to know that exists kind of thing? That was going to be my next question. The problem with my doctor's office, they want the person or persons that I select to be present to notarize their signatures. Well, if they're in another state and it's hard to get them to your doctor's office, that is a problem. Yeah. How would you that's handle one example, that? Would that's you... one example of that form or that procedure not following what the law actually says. So the the patient advocates do not have to have their signature notarized or witnessed, and they can sign at any time beyond after you have signed the document. So after you've made the nomination, they can sign that patient advocate acknowledgement at any point prior to making decisions for you. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good question. My question is like, if you just said it like if I signed something with my doctor and I had to go to the hospital how does that document get to the hospital am I supposed to carry that in my purse at all times how does that work how would someone know that I have a document 
I, I don't think, guardian. I don't think that there's a I don't think that there is one general answer to that that someone is going to know, unfortunately. So what we recommend um, is a couple a couple of things to protect you for that. One, um, that you do a power of attorney for healthcare, a specific durable power of attorney for healthcare, fill out your living will and all of those other things, but share your power of attorney for healthcare with your physician, okay. right? And if your physician is linked with a, a system Hopefully that stays in the system, whether you go to the hospital in that system um, or anytime you go to get medical treatment, a surgery, okay. to bring that document with you and have them scan it in. Now, okay. Jane is 100% correct in that, um, you know, most, most times people go to the doctor, they're asking you, hey, can you mm -hmm. fill this out or do you have this? We right. recommend that you um, have a power of attorney for healthcare and then share that and don't fill out anything after that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with specific places because it could accidentally negate what you've done prior um, and without you meaning to do that. So mm -hmm. to do your document um, and to have, you know, a universal Michigan one that would work whether you're going to IHA, U of M, okay. a, a doctor up north, that is okay it complies with Michigan law and that you share that document and not do a subsequent one. Okay. My last question, for example, like would my, if something were to happen to me, would my husband or my daughter automatically have the rights to my medical condition? No. no. So if you're talking about getting information about your condition, that would be covered by... No, I mean, if if I were to make decisions, my final decision. Oh, okay. To make your decisions, no. There is no provision in the law that lets, um, that a family member can just step in and make these decisions. So that's why you have to have the powers of attorney. Now, as I say, as a practical matter, a lot of times physicians and hospitals will turn to family members and say, what do you want me to do? And, and give them, you know, take, take the information from them and act on it. But there's, it's not formal. It's not something that is provided for in the law. Okay. So I, I explain it like, like this. If you don't designate a patient advocate um, correctly uh, in the law, there is no one with legal authority to make decisions on your behalf if you can't make them for yourself. Mm. So that that's okay. when the court would step in if somebody if something happened to someone um, and decisions need to be made. Hello, Jane um, just alluded to like the hospitals will ask, um, which um, I'm not a fan of, but th that happens. <laughs> um, and uh, that person may or may not be someone who an individual would want making decisions for them or uh, may, may or may not be a person who would make the same decisions as the, as the sick person. So that's why these documents are so important. Um, and then, you know, the court usually steps in if there's an issue, right? So let's say you have two family members who aren't agreeing, you know, um, you know, I see a lot of times the hospitals filing guardianship petitions in those matters. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Jennifer. Hi, Jane and Amanda. Thank you so much for coming today. I really appreciate you being here. Um, I have two questions and I'll say them both and then uh, turn it over to you. But what about older adults who don't have any resources, don't have any family members, don't have that $250 to get this done, uh, what happens in those cases or what, where can people go? And my second question is about um, how is the DPOA empowered? What are the things that need to be in place for a person to make decisions? Because just because we have that document doesn't mean that they necessarily have the right immediately to make those de decisions. So uh, what, are the process, uh, what are the processes for those sorts of things? So 
for people who don't have funds and don't have people to make the decisions, those are two different um, barriers to people. Um, the first one, um, legal services normally will do powers of attorney. Um, and like I say, filling out the one that the doctor or the hospital provides is better than nothing. So um, I would recommend doing that. Um, there are um, sometimes there are um, like legal fairs where, you know, we set up a booth and people can come in and, you know, um, occasionally those are done along with the uh, caregiver fairs. I know we've done it down in Milan before. Um, with regard to who they can appoint, there are professionals who will do this. Um, and my suggestion is that they should interview a few people and decide who they want to work with. Um, a lot of times um, we end up with people who court appoints us or clients have asked us to be their um, patient advocate when they can't do it and you know make their own decisions anymore. Um, and you know sometimes we end up working with them throughout the end of their lifetime whether or not they can continue paying. So a lot of times if they end up in a nursing home, we end up getting paid $95 a month um, for doing all of their bill paying, reapplying for Medicaid, this type of thing. So there are some systems in place. Those rely on attorneys and social workers who are step up and are willing to do this because it's the right thing to do, which I is why I say the more pressure that gets put mm -hmm. on as public guardians, the more you're going to lose the good people who are out there doing it um, in an ethical way and under the goodness of their heart. So um, that's that. Amanda, you want to address the second part of that? Sure. How do they become um, what did activated. I would say activated, right? Um, and so a power of attorney for medical usually within the document will tell you how it's activated. So our document here. Um, requires two physician signatures before a substitute decision maker can um, start making decisions on behalf of someone. So, um, you know, the, we require a, a treating physician um, and then the <clears throat> physician signature as well. And if the person regains capacity, um, letters from two physicians can reverse the activation and restore the person to their own decision making. Yep. Great, thank you. Uh, Margie? Um, yes, thanks so much for a great presentation. Um, mm -hmm. We ought to make sure that even younger people get this uh, presentation or know about this. Um, you know, I, I have been medical power of attorney for several people. And um, um, one of the things that has been a resource for me has been if the person is a member of a faith community, um, often that faith community has uh, forms to fill out, options for people, you know, everything from what, what verses and songs do you want at your funeral, uh, do you want a funeral? Um, and even even things like things to do uh, to have in place before you die, like what are your passwords and uh, where are my where are your documents? All kinds of detail about that. And my church happens to have several of those kinds of documents. And we had a class <clears throat> presented by one of the pastors. And she really um, encouraged people to write their own obituary or to at least put the details, clear details down. I know that I wound up writing an obituary for a, a good friend of mine and it took me days to find all the information. So um, do your family a favor and put that that detail together before you die. Um, and um, then just let your advocates know where all that 
material is. And often the church will want a copy. So it's a great resource. That's it. Hi. Um, thank you for a great presentation. I wanted to ask a couple of things and then make a comment. And my questions are, I know that the state of Michigan has a website that has information about advanced directives and medical power of attorneys and the state bar also has a legal help website that has that information. Are those useful resources, especially for people who may not be connected with an attorney? I think, again, those are good forms to look to. I probably would look to that before I'd look to some of the um, forms that the doctor's offices are handing out, just because I've seen some really poorly written ones. But um, yes, if, if the person doesn't have the resources to come in and get the counseling and sit down and go through the questions um, and have it drafted, then it is it is certainly better than not having anything. I, I, would, I would just add really, um, really the benefits too of is counsel, right? So versus reading something, thinking that you understand what it means, um, and then, you know, signing it and really knowing and understanding the signing, the authority that you're giving away to a person and how these things work together is the benefit of counsel, right? And so that's why, you know, Jane is saying like, we would rather have you sign that than anything, but, you know, really to come see an attorney because you're missing that whole counseling part. <clears throat> and you could be the brightest person in the room, but if you don't have legal background, you may think something means one thing um, when it means something different, um, just because they're legal terms and they're not easy to understand um, if you don't have that legal background. So that's why we're just saying. Right, the other protection that I think having counsel provides is there are oftentimes allegations of incapacity or undue influence and a lawyer can help to um, provide testimony that a document is truly what the the person wanted they came in alone we met with them alone with you know they received the counseling we talked about why they didn't want uh, to name other the other children or you know somebody who's complaining so so there you know that's the other piece and then the third piece is the signing um a lot of times we see documents come back where you know, the person who's been appointed as patient advocate is signed as one of the witnesses. <laughs> That's not going to work. So there are certain people who are disqualified from being witnesses. Um, sometimes it's witness but not notarized. Sometimes the notary leaves off their commission. So those kinds of things can crop up and, and nobody notices them until it's too late, until it's needed. So, yeah. And the comment I had is picking up on, on what your presentation has stressed, communication and really making an individual's desires clear. Margaret mentioned, and our church has done that too, the conversations ahead of time, not just about what you want your funeral to look like, but what do you want end of life care to look like? And you mentioned five wishes, and while their documents um, don't aren't specific to Michigan, and their documents might not be useful, I have noticed that looking at their website and thinking about the kinds of questions to discuss with your family can be helpful. And that's fivewishes.org. And I would also encourage people to not just think of the older adult to be starting the discussion, but if you are a caregiver mm -hmm. or even if you're a child, my parents gave us kids a wonderful gift by years before they had the pre-planned funeral. They wrote their obituary, they had their funeral planned and they had the hard discussion 
with the three of us. When I am not able to make a medical decision, this is what I want. And so when that time came, the three of us kids were all knew what each parent wanted and were able to say, we know this is what mom wanted. And um, what a gift they gave to us. It, it is an amazing gift, yes. Thank you. Bruce? Um, like my colleagues, I want to thank you for a, a very helpful presentation. And having just gone through this process, I, I um, appreciate the importance. Um, I have two quick questions. One is, people have identified some community resources that are available, um, legal services, the faith-based communities, um, possibly doctor's offices. Have you found any other organizations and maybe a couple of the umbrella organizations, Catholic Social Services and uh, Jewish Family Services. Have you found any other community organizations or resources in Washington County that have this in focus and have an interest that people could also um, make use of? There's a lot of organizations that have had presentations and focused on this, but as far as getting the forms, um, not, not really. I think the state bar form and then the ones that hospitals and doctors are using um, would be it. Um, as far as focus on it, yes. I mean, we've been asked to present at the Milan Senior Center, the Ipsy Township Senior Center, um, we've done several church uh, presentations. Um, so we try to get out there and present as much as possible so that we're, you know, we're spreading the word and talking to people about it. But Yeah. And so if, you know, you go to local, um, you know, localized fairs that um, like Senior Housing Week here, um, like Jane just talked about Milan, the Milan Fair that we go to, um, you know, a, a, attending those type of events, you always can see uh, what new organizations are within your community um, for community outreach and assistance. <laughs> and then um, get brochures on, um, you know, people who or organizations who are longstanding in the community as well. Okay, so that, <laughs> that that's helpful that you guys at least make whatever effort you can. And um, it's just, uh, I'm just trying to think about how people can get to good advocacy resources prior to becoming patients or critical facing critical situations. Um, the mm -hmm. other question I have is just a more general quick response, but I know you focus mostly on the topics of end of life and, and, uh, and powers of attorney, things like that. The, the term aging in place, is that a term that you use? Um, I only ask that because it has a larger connotation to it. And I'm just wondering if that's part of your language in terms of how you uh, you do your work. I would I mean, I've heard that term throughout um, just by being connected with the types of um, uh, organizations that we talk to. So um, I, I, we are part of um, the, the name is escaping me now. We go Washington, Washington County senior leaders. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I mean, I, I don't even know where I picked up that term at. It could have been here within our office or with the social worker or, you know, um, mm -hmm. with an assisted living. Um, so I'm no. curious as to what connotation, um, I've, I've not heard anything about that before. Can you say a little more? Um, I'll just give a 10 second response because it's a, long, a longer response and I know time is um, running here, but um, the state has put out to get put together reports on aging in place. It involves a lot more, it's all of what you guys do, plus a lot of things that also need to be in place what are sometimes referred to as um, social determinants of health and other factors that go into how people live healthy lives. And so while the use of the term is understandable because some people are using it, it's really a lot more complicated and um, and we need to be doing more to sort of bring that to people's attention and understanding. So I, I just 
that's a, that's a short answer. Interesting. Thank you for bringing that yeah. up. I'll yeah. look at those reports. Thank you. Uh, Thank Phyllis? you. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention a couple things to reinforce what um, what you have said about the the counseling part of making these decisions. I'm aware that um, very often people will say, well, I don't want any extenuating uh, treatments happening. Um, I don't want to live on a machine, for instance. But sometimes there's a procedure that's needed to get over a certain medical hurdle. And then, and then the, uh, uh, the person really can, uh, can live on their own any, at, at that point. So uh, what I've become aware of is how important it is that the, the patient advocate really understands where you're coming from and can think through these, these things that probably less is better in writing than um than more i i had a friend who who was filling out his at that time living will and he must have 20, 25 different conditions that he made um a decision about when he was like 60. well now in his mid 80s i'm sure the situation is very different so uh, this just a push for your your counseling on that um and the other thing i wanted to just throw out that uh to tell people there is something that you can draw up called an ethical will and that's just something for you to your family of what your values are, what your druthers are for them, what what you think your life has meant to you and maybe to them. Um, so it's I, I'd be glad to talk to anybody further if they're if they're interested in that. I've never heard of an ethical will, so that's a new term for it's me. not legal. It's not legal. It's I've just heard of it before. but it, yeah, um, I would like to just comment on what you said previously about the the 20 different scenarios and, you know, checking yes or no. Um, and this isn't meant to scare any of you, but what sits with me um, is that I had a client early on in my practice, um, so about 10, 11 years ago, come in um, with a questionnaire with a bunch of different scenarios and wanted me to walk through it. Um, and I just was just reading through them and it asked the question was, would you um, would you ever want dialysis? A dialysis picture in my mind, my dad was on dialysis and it was pretty taxing. So I have one picture of dialysis. But Phyllis, you spoke to sometimes you just need a medical procedure to get over a hump. Mm -hmm. um, and then during that time, when I was reading that question, I had just had another client who um, was very ill due to a car accident. Um, and just uh, and his body started to shut down, he just needed a couple of, um, it was hopeful that just a couple rounds of dialysis would kickstart his kidneys. And those are two very different scenarios with dialysis. And it often sits with me, if someone checked no, <laughs> would they not get dialysis in either of those situations, right? And so that's a great point that you bring up, Phyllis, is that, you know, instead of cornering someone into a box of with all of those different scenarios, really talking to your patient advocate so they know you and they know what you would want and what you mean by certain things. And, you know, allowing the second scenario where it kickstarts your kidneys versus 
like if you didn't want long-term dialysis. So that's the importance of that. I know we're running short on time. I had two things that I wanted to mention that occurred to me. One is that um, there is now a profession starting called uh, end-of-life doula. And if, okay, good, I'm seeing nodding. I've, one of my clients worked with uh, end-of-life doula and it was just an amazing process. So I wanted people to know that resources out there. Um, the other thing is to make sure that those documents, the medical power of attorney and the do not resuscitate order, if you sign one, are handy. Um, DNRs should be hung on the refrigerator because the EMS is trained to look on and around the refrigerator. Um, otherwise, they're they're not going to, you know, they're not going to pay attention to it if they don't know it's there. So they've got to know it. For the medical power of attorney, a couple things that you can do to make sure they're handy is to uh, scan them in digitally and put them in your cell phone. Make sure each of your patient advocates has a copy. Make sure any physician you see on a regular basis has a copy. And sometimes your local um, ambulance service will be willing to put them on file there. So um, some good tips on where to put them. <coughs> Thank you. Brenda, last question. Yes. Um, I don't know if I heard you say or not. Will you be attending our event next Friday on the 14th? You know, we just found out about it. I My spouse is having surgery that day, but I know our um, office manager is working on getting one of our attorneys and one of our staff people to come. So yes, we're we're hoping to be there. Great. And if you can bring some information and all that good stuff, we would really appreciate it. We Thank will. You. We'll also bring Brack Scratchers. So those are. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so um, much. Thank you. <laughs> yep, yep. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much you, for both of you for coming and answering our questions today, giving some education. I just want to remind everyone who's listening right now that our videos, are, our meetings are posted to YouTube. And so if you have people who could really benefit from hearing just this high level overview, I really would encourage you to share it once it's posted. Um, and Jane and Amanda, I also heard you both mention Medicaid spend down and the long term care insurance. And so I think we should have you back. Um, within the next year to talk more about those because that Medicaid spend down is such like a, a big complicated thing. And if you could help give an overview, I'm sure um, this group would really appreciate it. And people who listen to our meetings would appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move you to attendees. You're also welcome to just to just go. Um, we really appreciate your time and hope to see you on Friday or one of your team members. Thanks absolutely. for having us. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Everyone have a great weekend. Thank you. All right. Um, that was that was really helpful and informative. Um, switching gears back to subcommittee updates. Um, let's do moving forward future planning millage <laughs> subcommittee. Um, <laughs> would like to share. Elizabeth. Um. Allison, Bruce, and I attended uh, the Board of Commissioners meeting uh, on Wednesday where they voted on the first reading um, of a proposed senior millage. Um, and I was able to share on behalf of the commission a document that Marie had helped put together that really shows the demographic silver tsunami, as I've heard it referred to, um, how in 2028, um, there'll be more people over age 65 plus in our county than under 18. And I think Marie, you already shared that with our membership. Um, I don't know that everyone has it. I am planning on sharing it in a few minutes um, so on this screen and then having it posted on our website. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know whether it'd be more useful for me to, to give some notes from last night's discussion yeah. uh, now, or you'd rather hold that? No, mm -hmm. please do it now. Okay. And then afterwards, if Allison and Bruce have things to add, um, the commissioners made some 
comments about the after the millage proposal was presented, Commissioner Labar spoke about the importance of the data and really thanked um, all the different advocacy groups for providing data. He said that the um, data about the demographic changes, the growth of the older population really um, helped garner his support for the millage. Commercial, Commissioner Sanders was concerned she expressed the idea that the adult service millage did not support families and children. And she was also concerned about um, the affordability for older adults with increased uh, property taxes. Commissioner Light really emphasized the importance of senior centers in addressing social isolation and providing sites for nutrition programs and health related programs is very supportive of expanding nutrition programs to meet special dietary needs, to provide a full day's worth of meals plus snacks, and seven days a week. Commissioner Robbie wanted to make sure that the millage resources were targeted towards older adults. He proposed an amendment which was passed to insert the definition from the Older Americans Act that uh, services would be targeted towards adults 60 years and older. He wanted to clarify that the County Office of Community Development would be the uh, entity administering this funding. And he spent some time discussing that his perception that county residents have developed a bit of a mistrust of county government and their spending decisions and procurement policies. So he suggested we be that this be really focused on specific things. And I know Marta Larson from the very beginning of our discussions has said, it's important to share exactly what a millage would support. And uh, Commissioner Robbie really re reinforced that. He also suggested maybe a looking as, as a spending plan is developed to go big, like take, we had listed different areas which we've identified over the last several years priorities. And he was saying, maybe even to focus more closely on some of those, uh, nutrition being one of them. Uh, we had a chance to discuss along with some other advocates, our joy at this vote and um, other things we might want to consider going forward. Um, focusing on existing programs and services and expanding to make sure need is met countywide. Um, ongoing support for senior centers, expansion of programs, providing both home repairs and home modifications, information about a new county office of older adults and its information and referral role, looking at age specific health programs like fall prevention programs and uh, MMAP, which provides uh, insurance about Medicare and Medicaid enrollment, caregiver support and respite and adult daycare programs uh, and case management. Um, and the idea that maybe we need to more explicitly show that support of older adults supports families because families on the whole are the caregivers and um, any support that we can give, especially in terms of respite care and uh, is going to, and information and support directly to caregivers is going to support the entire family structure. And I would be remiss without mentioning uh, uh, how very effective uh, the presentation was um, by Jason, our former uh, commission um, liaison, who really gave a very uh, detailed and moving argument for support of this. And I don't know if uh, Allison and Bruce, if you have other things you'd like to add. 
I think that's a great summary, Elizabeth. And um, I, I think it, you know, it um, hit all the high notes. And um, as you said, I think it was a, a good evening for everybody. Um, I would just add one thing to that. And because of folks worrying about um, older adults who are on limited income, I think it'll be really important when we talk about future planning and when we'll go into the next phase is talking about the exempt, the homestead exemption and how that might impact oh. and communicating that with people because I don't remember it's it's different in every municipality so maybe Annie or someone from the county would be able to chime in us because is it if if the millage is over a certain amount the exemption doesn't exist if it's over a certain amount like if we had a mill that was like a millage that was like two mills like the home the exemption goes away but this is a smaller one so I, I think communicating that how the exemption might work would help for folks who are a lower resource and really communicating that. We can't just assume people know what that means. So that's the piece I would bring out because it would counter a little bit of what Carolyn um, kind of brought up that for the lower resource seniors, I think we really have to do a good job of communicating that. And there was a lot of hesitation for her and I was personally surprised that she actually said yes. So I think, especially with, we have one more vote and like Marie said, like. We're not done yet. We got to still communicate with them the next um, month and do that. So I, that was the piece that I thought still saw as a threat for us. And um, just to chime in for a second, um, I think Marta might be able to share some of her uh, recent uh, expertise in talking about the homestead exemption. I know in your community, you've mentioned that is an issue. Well, I, I haven't really gotten very far with that, but the Housing Bureau for Seniors has a lot of really good data on that, and I'm hoping to have something soon. Right, so we won't all bombard Housing Bureau for Seniors. We'll just all bombard you, Marta, for that information. <laughs> Margie? Um, well, I, I was, thanks for that summary, Elizabeth. I was able to watch um, that and um, Jason's review was spectacular, and I I tend to think he got a lot of it from Marie's document, mm -hmm. um, but um, it really was wonderful. And um, the the other thing I want to mention is when we're talking about this uh, to the public, I think we need to be uh, sort of make sure that we say this will bring in um, all parts of the county where, where you know, in the past, many areas have had um, very little access to services, more so than others. So equaling, equalizing that, I think, is important to say. Thank you. Bruce? Um. This sort of runs into a little bit of the report from the subcommittee as well. Um, the subcommittee, both focusing on the millage and and, and forward looking and planning. Um, and I think we saw, and I think it was especially driven home after the meeting, that we saw a clear role and clear opportunity for the commission to play a role over these next, especially over these next few months. Um, have people ever done photography, you know, even before iPhones, do you know, the term depth of field where some things look up, up close are very much in focus, but there's important things also in the background. I think in a lot of ways, part of our work ahead of us is a kind of depth of field strategy where the things that are in the foreground are those concrete things that will really provide the kind of help to people. And those have been well-established, the transportation, the food, um, security, um, you know, caregiving. There was a number of ones that are listed in this, the say yes work. And then there's other things that need to also accompany that. And I would hope that we could, as a group, begin to talk about strategies um, and resources that we would like to leverage 
as a result of the, you know, if the millage does get passed, um, Allison noted some things going on in Ohio that even got the attention of the, um, the board of commissioners. Uh, they have been able to leverage resources um, for virtually every senior center in the state. And um, I think there are things that we could play where we can play a really productive role in sort of broadening um, that that vision of what we need to do so we could both meet the challenges of addressing the more critical needs facing some of the seniors, but also speak to the broader public about why this kind of investment does provide benefits for families, for caregivers and others, both immediate and longer term. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Brenda? Yes, I have a question for Elizabeth. Elizabeth, when you were reading your report, who did the county say they wanted to oversee the millage funding once it's passed? My understanding, and I did not have the text of the millage proposal that they were voting on in front of me from discussions uh, with Jason, my understanding is they wanted it administered through the regular purchasing procedures and the um, these kinds of programs are currently being uh, administered by the Office of Community Development and they are in support of forming a separate Office on Aging with staff, yes. if I'm correct. You know what I would like to see, I would like to just throw out to the board is that I would love to see someone from our group also included. Um, it's just something I was thinking about. It would be nice to have someone from say yes to seniors or uh, just to also be included. Yeah, one of the things I've seen on documents, not that it's official or anything at this point, but that they would have members. So when when applications come in, agencies who want access to the senior millage funds to do the work that they're doing with this population, that it would be reviewed by a committee. And on the committee, there would be the Office on Aging, there would be COA members, there would be um, uh potentially um, agencies who do not that work, right? There'd be conflict of interest, but other like stakeholders like that. So there would be a committee reviewing those. Board of commissioners would make that final decision. And then they're administered through OCED because they do that procurement and contracting process uh, for the rest of the county. Okay, um, that makes me happy to hear. I don't want it to be just left up not saying that they would not do a good job because I'm sure they would, but I don't want it to be just left up to county administration to mm -hmm. determine how the millage is spent. That's all. Yeah. yeah. I think when we get to that point, I we could make a, a memo or a resolution to to, you know, express, you know, from our point of view as the Commission on Aging and Advisory Board, this is what we would like to see happen. Thank you. Let, make a note of that so we remember to do that later thank you yeah um so a couple of things that i wanted to mention if you have not yet reached out to your commissioner to say thank you for their support please do that um they didn't all have to vote yes some of them could have still vote no and it could have passed but all of them voted yes on the first reading. And I think that's a, a really big deal and saying thank you, keeping this excitement, this positivity going forward, I think carries a lot of weight, especially with some of the other decisions they they have to be making. And so um, I think we should, we should be reaching out and saying thank you. And then also like, we still have July 10th coming. What else, where, where are you at on the July 10th um, uh, second reading? Is there, you know, anything that we could do to help you to kind of get that, um, if there's something that they're looking for, some more information or answers to other questions, you can bring it back to this group and we can help get that information out there um, back to you and to, and to others. Um, Brenda, is your hand up again or is that from before? Oh, no, 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 let me let it down. I'm sorry. Okay. No, you're fine. Elizabeth? 
I think Allison's comment about property tax exemptions is a useful additional information. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like approaching the Housing Bureau for seniors for any data they might have readily available mm -hmm. might be useful to collect and share. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh, Jennifer. Um, should the commission or the subcommittee um, for communication, should we be maybe drafting some type of uh, email that everyone could possibly use for their um, commissioner to reach out and say thank you or to offer some, you know, questions uh, that we can use? Um, you're more than welcome to. Um, I think that. Um, I mean, so part of part of me is like, I want I want you each each of us to individually write like our sincere thank you and not have a template in this case. Um, you don't need a bunch of lines to say thank you. It's it's just the one. And then can we offer to help? I think that um, everyone can can do that on your own. If you want to start collecting that homestead information for municipalities with Housing Bureau for Seniors and get that drafted for us, that would be great. <laughs> Awesome. Um, and I, it sounds like Marta's working on getting that too. So if you guys want to collaborate on that, that would that would be really helpful. Um, Allison? So the one thing that I heard Yusuf say, and, and I don't know if Carolyn had said it too, and I think Andy had mentioned it a little bit too, is we did have a lot list in there. And I think I wasn't sure if that came from us or from say yes to seniors. I know we were kind of working on it a little bit together, but they wanted that refinement because as Elizabeth was saying, like they wanted to see, like, maybe we say, what are the highest priority three and how we might move the needle on those, like with an example might be helpful or refining that a bit, because that definitely seems to be of concern still mm -hmm. and maybe just thinking about how to refine those or group those a little bit more might be worthwhile between now and that meeting and then communicating that to key people and maybe annie could even speak to that just to give us some direction of whether that should be something we kind of help on or it's more like say yes to seniors to do yeah annie if we can um hear your thoughts on this discussion so far in the millage and respond to alice's Allison's question, if you're available. Um, hey, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So um, I think the question was about like the scope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, did, did I, I can send everybody the actual like item with the document that has everything listed if you haven't seen it. Um, it's everything that we talked about at working session um, when Jason kind of led the discussion. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. I Yeah, please. That would be great. Be great. Yeah. And then just in terms of like comments made by other commissioners. Um, I think there are some commissioners who want everything to happen in house. And then there's a majority of us who said that it needs to be like a hybrid approach where we have some services in house, like the office on aging. And then we also do um, an annual RFP process and have like um, standard dollars that go to our senior centers. Um, and so there's a, there's a few different like buckets. Um, and then I also, I'll just say, it's flexible though, like the language is flexible enough so that like if year one doesn't go as well as we thought, we can re we can we can plan better for the next year. Yeah, thank you. Um, one thing that uh, Jason was talking to me about when we were having discussions um, was that it not coming too much from outside how how agencies or other people want to spend these dollars to really let it be the board of commissioners say, this is how we want to spend these dollars. Um, and then keep that flexibility in there, like Annie mentioned. Um, and so I think I would just want to get some more feedback from Jason, Annie and others on, on any more discussion or uh, honing down the the list that was in there. And actually I'm gonna share my screen now. So the rest of you who haven't seen the document that, um, that I helped put together, 
which is separate than what Jason was reading from. He and I use the same sources. Um, let's see, which screen do I want to share this with? Um, so I made a, a two page document that starts with, you know, why now? That was one of the questions we were hearing a lot from um, some of the commissioners, you know, why, why does it need to be this time? Why does it need to be November? Why can't it be 2026 with one of our next elections? And so um, we back in our Commission on Aging 2021 report, um, there was a, a partner I had at the um, Institute of Gerontology who made this um, graphic for us so we could see that age swap um, 16 and or I'm sorry, 18 and younger and those age 65 and older where we see that happening and we see that happening in 2028. Right. And there's some um, additional statistics here just to kind of you know, give some more meanings to the lines that you see, but that's that's really the big, the big swap there. And then more recently, um, I went to a SEMCOG, um, our aging region webinar, and they offered this uh, graphic where you can see our Washtenaw County right here, and the um, each township and municipality where their aging population is um, back in 2022, not too long ago. And then where we expect it to be in 2050. And you can see, especially in Western Washtenaw, um, there is a, a significant shift. Um, and so that was one of the other demographics that we used in some narratives to kind of give it a little bit more um, meat. And then on the second page, something that um, the Say Yes to Seniors group had started, and I just tried to summarize a little bit so it, it fit more nicely on this document was what what are some possibilities? How could this be used based on um, Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation's report, um, the one they're currently wrapping up right now, the one they did in 2020 um, with their root cause survey. Um, in 2019, AAA1B did their um, community survey and housing, nutrition, transportation are the top three and have remained the top three things. And so that's, we start with county administration because some office and aging things, information referral things need to happen. Um, housing, here are some possibilities within housing that the dollars could be used for nutrition, transportation. Um, and then of course, health and wellness captures the senior centers. It captures um, legal assistance. Um, one of the things that I know legal services in Southeast Michigan has done before and they would like to do more of is to make home visits. Think about our homebound seniors. Do they have this stuff in place? They tend, not all of them, but, you know, a good chunk of those people we serve could be under-resourced um, and they can't leave their home very easily. Uh, so what if, what if end-of-life planning came to them, right? And those, those could be ways the dollars are spent. And then, of course, some capital buildings, emergency response uh, type programs. I'll have Taylor email this to you so you can see it better. Um, and then we can also put this on the website. Um, I didn't put my name on it. I put Washtenaw Commission on Aging because I really made it uh, from from like this, this body and, and support from this body. How soon can we get this? Uh, I can have Taylor send it out after the meeting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a great document. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, the graphs already existed. The yeah, those already existed. Say us to seniors really did the legwork on this, so I just I kind of just put it all together. I don't see where. It, oh, it's on my other screen. <clears throat> um, Annie and Ashley, one of the questions that. I had, if I can stop sharing, um, where does our public advocacy start and end? The Commission on Aging has made a resolution to support a 0.5 mil or to recommend a 0.5 mil. Um, we recommended an office on aging, but Tech, because we're technically county employees, um, we're also not allowed to tell people how to vote. 
right? Um, and so I'm wondering if you have any other guidance on on where that line is for us. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Well, you're you're all absolutely allowed to tell people how to vote and advocate for the millage um, because you have a First Amendment right to do that. Um, I would say you, I wouldn't go around with a flyer saying I'm on the Commission on Aging, so yes, on this millage, but you as Marie or you as Elizabeth can say, hey, my name's Elizabeth, please vote yes on this millage. And that's totally fine, just like you can for any other um, issue that might be on the ballot. Um, in terms of advocacy, I mean, the, you you know, you guys sent the resolution for the Office on Aging. The commissioners have that. That's something that if the millage passes, we'll be able to do. But I don't think we'll be able to do that without the millage passing, right? Because we right. need the money to do that. And so um, I think we just have to see how November goes. Yeah. All right. So no, no like um, Facebook post commission on aging supports the senior millage, but Marie Gress. Um, I, I think that probably crosses the line, okay. but if you all wanted to like form some sort of like um, shared messaging yeah, like I think that crosses the line, but like you could all independently get together as individuals and come up with like a graphic and all share it Facebook. I just wouldn't say commission on aging. Great. That's oh, um, Annie, can we do something like this? Friends of the senior millage and take up donations and have a flyer done to circulate you the community to support yeah. The senior millage, can we do something like that? Yeah, you could. So I, it would be as friends. independent citizens, as independent citizens, the, anybody could start a committee to advocate on behalf or against a millage. Okay, so we can citizens. say friend, friends of uh, senior millage supporting it, and we can take up donations to help, you know, for flyers and things like that that would be legal well so no 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 so i'm trying to be careful with what i say on this call because i don't want to get into like uh crossing the line on what i'm allowed to talk about but right uh as independent citizens you all have the right to form political committees to advocate on behalf or against millages whether it's a senior millage or the mental health and public safety millage and so you're allowed to do that and the, the clerk's office would explain how to set that up and how to name it and and what you have to do if you want to raise money for that but i don't want to cross the line here and, and um get in trouble for mm -hmm. for giving you right. all political advice right yeah. i understand that i understand that um, but I'm happy to talk to you maybe offline. Okay. Super. And say us to seniors is it also their own group. And so I would encourage you, Brenda, to talk with them too um, before creating something additional. Um, yeah. Bruce, I have you and then Elizabeth. Um, two things. One is... Um, the advocacy question, I think Annie's advice has been helpful. Um, I think you can, as long as you steer away from that endorsement, you can present things like the facts, the benefits, and the possibilities. You can present information that people can come to their own conclusions. You just can't tell them mm -hmm. um, or urge them. So presenting facts, like much like, Marie did in that document, I think, um, having say yes is information, but talking to people about this is what the cir circumstances is, are there are benefits to this kind of approach, and here are some of the possibilities that people are, you know, looking into. Th that kind of advocacy is different from the kind of crossing the line um, advocacy. So that was one thing I just wanted to note. Um, the second point I wanted to make, I think, is really plays off of the report out from the committee and and from um, Marie's two page document, which is that there's this wonderful tension between prioritizing what we want to do with this millage money because it's not going to solve everything and 
going big as Commissioner Robbie talked about. And there were heads that nodded when he said that. And I think what we're saying and what we're seeing in a two page document that um, Marie put together is sort of both sides of that. The the demographics suggest the need to go big because things are changing in such profound ways. And the say yes listing of priorities begins to give us, you know, some really good footholds from where, we, where you start this work. But we're never going to have enough resources from this millage to do what we really need to do. So we have to have an additional supportive plan. Ideally, that comes from the community, or at least as community support that talks about this is just step one or this is just an early step. We've done a lot of work. We've done a lot of thinking. We have a lot of stuff to build on. And, you know, we want to present both priorities and a bigger plan. Thank you. Elizabeth? You saw my head going no when we were talking about raising money, doing stuff like that. I am very concerned that it will negatively impact sharing information about the millage if the Commission on Aging is seen in a lobbying role. No, I wasn't. As, and just, may I finish, please, Brenda? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have produced, as a commission, lots of great documents. All our reports, this document mm -hmm. we put together on behalf of the commission, which are great things to share with people. But I'm very, I think, in terms of what we traditionally might see as a campaign, we need to be very careful to do, as Bruce said, sharing information. And we may not be the people who are best at doing a campaign which say yes to seniors has really been carrying the water for 10 years and working with them but i'm concerned that any remarks that have been made up to now could in any way be interpreted as we even representing ourselves as commission members um as to use annie's words crossing the line and that's why I think it's key to maybe make a clear distinction in all our conversations on am I talking as an individual person, not at this meeting, or are we talking as commission members sharing information? And I don't know, Ashley, if you, other commissions have run into similar issues. If I could jump in, um, we can we can come back and send an email out to let you all know the I think maybe something something that would have been relevant the environmental council, um, maybe people probably tried asking them to get on the record about the E two climate millage, and I'll try to find out how they navigated that. Oh great, uh, Margie. Yeah, I um I have to support Elizabeth's concerns. Um, you know, there was mention of building trust at the meeting the other night. And I I think we need to be cognizant of that as well. I see the say yes to seniors group as an entirely different story that they can do what they want. But um I, I really think we should not get into this and in raising funds. So I would be very much against it. Brenda? Well, I want to clarify when I made that comment, I wasn't referring to the Commission on Aging. I was referring to a group in general supporting the millage. So I should have, when I said that, I should have said, that I wasn't talking about the Commission on Aging. We were talking about, can we talk to people and ask them to support the millage? And we were told we can do it on an individual basis, but not as Commission on Aging. 
so when I mentioned that, I wasn't talking about referring to Commission on Aging, just in general, how could we get paperwork or information out into the community so that people would know to support the millage. So that's what I meant, and I want to clarify that. There's got to be a way that we can give, get the information out to seniors or people to support the senior millage. Yeah. So that's what I was referring to. But Thank I didn't you. make myself clear in the beginning, so I apologize. Uh, Margie, did you have something Thank to Thank you for that clarification, Brenda. Um, you know, I think what, what um, bothered me, well, not only the collection of funds, but also friends of the uh, senior millage, regardless of whether we're private citizens, we're also known to be on this commission. And so, you know, there it, it's not going to be a secret that we, um, several of us, are part of this. So I, I just want us to be so clean about this. And so I, I just can't go there. I can understand. Great. Um, communication subcommittee, anything additional? Nope. Awesome. Um, report from the Board of Commissioners. Annie, anything in additional that you would like to share with the commissioners? Um, no, and I just, I apologize for coming halfway through. Um, I, yeah, um, just wanted to say sorry. But it's a little later. All good, all good. Um, the only other report from me at this time is a reminder to reach out to your commissioner and say thank you for their support and um, offer a listening ear. Just listening to where they're at, what questions they still might have. Um, relationships are key. I've been saying that for a few meetings. And so having that relationship, um, being a good listener uh, is going to go leaps and bounds for us as we get into this final stretch. July 10 is the second reading. Um, I'm sure I'll be sending some additional things out uh, before then. Um, and say yes to seniors, I'm sure is going to have additional things out. Barbara on her um, public comment mentioned she and I have been chatting to try and get information together too. Um, and so we'll try to keep everybody posted. Um, there are no items under new business. Anyone want to raise any new business? Great. Um, then our next meeting is August 2, where we hope to have a care coordinator and someone from the Silver Key Coalition um, come talk to us about some aging in place initiatives and, and how the work that they do help our people stay in place. So um, motion to adjourn. Everybody thumbs up. Yes. Great. Um, see you all August 2, if not sooner. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. I was muted. Marie, we were going to have Jennifer and Brenda. That's right. Let's make an executive decision. Oh, we're still recording. Um, let's make an executive